Thank you all for coming. My name is Mohammed Salemi. I'm going to do my best to do a reading of the exhibition for you, titled Under the Volcano by Hugo, my friend. But to start, I think given the diversity of ways in which people usually talk about art and what art means to people, I think the most important thing for me is to sort of define for my, for what, me, what, what, is it, what art means to me and how I enter this work. I think it's very important to have maybe a few minutes first to talk about that before we begin looking at the work because that hopefully that will create a frame through which we can approach the work. So for me, as someone whose research has been mostly on the evolution of uh, media technology and its impact on uh, human civilization in a way, that's what I'm, at least that's what I'm known for. Art itself, or good art, is the highest form of technology, highest form of media technology. And if you just go back to your art history books that some of you who studied art probably remember, it's not that old compared to other forms of technologies that have been with humans. It's only, some people say, five, six, seven thousand year old, right? Since the cave paintings, right? So really, it's not really even an old form of technology. It's a new form of technology. And this is like a looking at what technology means in a longer sort of like historical span. Because to a lot of people who are doing recent uh, studies of what is technology, te technology begins with, with, with the earliest form of animals, like ants use technology. Any, any time for like, for like a 21st century understanding of the word technology, any time a being takes something out of the nature and put it to use towards survival or towards like a better life, that's technology. So, and we've started from like the moment where animals took something that already existed and applied it to life to say when we made more complex tools, which they, which comes with sort of like just pre-human chimpanzees when they broke a rod for say and then used that because it, it, they already knew that it's sharper to break it, to break up uh, a fruit then on to more complex tool in which we ha we're dealing with early humans in which they combine different tools to create a more complex tool from that, from that to like slow realization that tools are the extension of the human body and then they develop tools that actually extended uh, the capabilities of the body like say the bow and arrow which basically does the same thing as throwing an arrow on to you can you can argue this this late this latest form of technology which is art which is the form of uh, trap making which is genealogy in, in, is in creating a creating a situation in which you can have the prey automatically come to you rather than you going to the prey so you set up a trap and the trap is a form of uh, environment a, a built environment camouflaged for the animal to fall into and and art art and this is like me quoting quoting people who are doing research on this art is belongs to that genealogy of technology it's a form of trap but what kind of a trap it is, is a trap for, it's a, it's a trap that from one end, it's uh, aesthetic and phenomenological. So it, 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 uh, it appeals to your senses to get you into the trap. So the senses are used as a way to attract you and bring you in. But once you fall into the trap, it switches and the work becomes cognitive because it tries to activate the way you think or change the way you think, or make you look at things in a different way using, using uh, the, the, the intelligence of the, art, the artist or the maker. So the first part is usually aesthetic. And then basically you can call pure formalism is a kind of art that just remains at that aesthetic level. It creates a beautiful compelling form that engages your <coughs> senses. It even pretends to have meaning, but really it doesn't really click into the second part of the second part of the function of the trap, which is to, to alter your mind. And art shares this genealogy with pr propaganda, with any kind of like, any kind of like operation like that, which is a way of sort of like uh, overtaking your mind. So to me, that is, that is sort of like 
where, where I come into this 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 work. So so, and then there's another aspect to how art understood in a historical sense. So we we I basically gave you a cognitive account of art, aesthetic cognitive or phenomenological cognitive, and then the second way to approach art is art as a historical document or as a monument, basically that belong to a particular time and space, and it like a time capsule that that holds uh, something about that moment and something about the culture that it comes from, from that time, and it saves it, fixes it, and saves it for the future readings. So that's sort of like a, also another way of defining what art is. And the second one coming comes from the not very well-known, but kind of well-known uh, art historian from Vienna, Vienna School, Aloha Regal, who basically defines like, for Regal, a shopping note from 1500 where somebody wrote on it what they were going to buy when they went to market in Venice is a monument. If you don't have any other monument that describes how people live in that moment. But because we have better monuments, we don't look at that piece of paper as a monument. We just think of it as like a note. But every piece of human culture recorded has this capability to be a historical monument because it captures something about that time and place and fixes it. So these are the two. These are the two approaches I use whenever. And, and then what, what what what's what becomes interesting if you c combine these two, you also get sort of like in, in in retrospect, you sort of like get the history of how an artist try to intervene and create new culture or alter the mind of the audience at that particular time when that monument was created. So it becomes all a recording of this engagement of. Because if, if the regular culture is about the smooth operation of a society, the normative culture, the mainstream culture, or whatnot, the art, and that's where art departs from that, is, is the art is trying to transform the culture and not just operate it smoothly. So then, then the artwork becomes a place where this struggle of the artist, as someone who wants to like design a trap, gets also documented and recorded in the work. So the work has these double layers. One is generally about the environment and the time that the art was made, and one is about the struggle of the artist to transform that. And to somehow, I mean, good art. There's a lot of art that like, doesn't do that. But we're talking about good art. We're not talking about like average art here. Uh, uh, so, so, so this is sort of like, and, and then hopefully I, I will return to these and, and maybe you make clear why did I start with this. So, um, so, some of you, most of you are familiar with what are the components of the work, but, it, but it's important to sort of like mention, mention all the components of the work, the physical components of the work, the, vis the visible and physical components of the work, which is basically the film that's being shown in the other room, and then the narration of the film, which is separated and it's over here, and then we have the the environmental sounds of the film, which are being played off the speaker in this in this corridor, and then there's the motion music for motion picture, which is the soundtrack, the music of the film, which is in the other room, the last room, and then you get the abstract painting and the fire installation that are kind of related because abstraction kind of like get out of the fire and kind of take over the space, and then you have what I call the postscript film, the patient and the psychoanalyst. These are the physical component of the, of the piece. But then there are elements that are not so physical and so like in the eye, which are Malcolm Laurie's book, Under the Volcano, which actually, as observed by my friend and colleague, Claudia, was written in the 50s in hindsight about the changing world between the two world wars. So, so basically, you can you can kind of summarize the book book as that. And if you guys are, I don't know how familiar you are with the book, but it's about the life of this British consul to Mexico named Jeffrey Furman and his brother Hugo, who he kind of like goes to, and and he's a the media guy. He's a reporter. He kind of represents like the media in the story, to me at least. And Yvonne, the wife, who comes back to save their marriage and their life, and the fact that Jeffrey Furman is an alcoholic and he's kind of going down. And then the other element of the the other element in the film is 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 Hugo's painting from 2008 called Endless Killing, which was done for a show curated by Charles Martinez, shown in 
Huarte Contemporary Art Center in, in Spain in 2008. And then, and then the, an, another sort of element that hovers around the, around the show is the Freud, uh, the Freud text. Which is which I'm gonna like uh, say a couple of th couple of things about it later when we get to the room. Uh, it's a manuscript that he dec claimed to be like transcripted from tape. First was pu published by Le, Le, Le Temps Modern in 1969, and uh, basically features a patient who rebels against it, against his, but in in Hugo's version, her psychoanalyst and insist that the, the, their, their therapy should be taped. But then the doctor kind of like refused to let that happen. But actually it's being taped, so then, then uh, they tape. But the interesting thing, which I was, when I was looking, looking this up was that uh, actually Freud wrote, there's, 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 this, there's, this, there's this two films here by John Huston. One of them is the original, Under the Volcano, which Hugo is basically remaking here. We can argue, and then th there was another film made by John Huston, which is uh, a, a film on Freud, which basically was an idea with him and Sartre. Sartre was supposed to write the trans uh, manuscript, and he did write the script for the film, but then it was too long, and then John Huston decided not to, not to shoot the film because it was too long. And actually, when he returned it to Sar Sartre and said it's too long, he re he came back with an eight-hour version. And then it was obvious that like they weren't getting along. And then and then the notes were basically, it was just basically it didn't never published and it was found later in his archive and only was published in the 80s. And then it was translated and, and published as a book called Freud's Freud's uh, well, Freud script Freud script. Uh, so Freud scenario. Uh, yeah, so so in a way you can you can also read that second second uh, attempt by uh, Hugo is another remake of another John Huston film, which is basically because the, the John Huston film is also a lot about like different dialogues that Freud had with different uh, patients. It's a really patient-heavy film, and the, the 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 manuscript of the book is 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 known as like this uh, basically. One of the first times when someone took psycho, psych, psychoanaly psychoanalysis and applied it to drama, and dramatized it, and kind of popularized it too, because even though it was long, but it was still written for a very mainstream audience. It was written for Hollywood audience, and it was never made into a film. So, can we just walk around a little bit? Okay, let's. So, let's go here. So this this type of work that. This one is off, right? It's off when he's not speaking. Uh, oh, I see. So the work, the work for me is uh, belongs to the belongs to this moment because what what he was doing goes along goes along the work of a, a few other artists I'm interested in. One of them being Ito Stero, which is trying to reinterpret the possibilities of moving image and cinema for the, for the post-cybernetic age and the 21st century. How to make, how to approach cinema without it being like the old days. And even though the content of Hito's work and uh, Hugo's work are completely different, uh, but, but I think, I think these, these, these artists are, are all working on this idea of how to re-employ cinema in, for 21st century. So in that sense, the work is, is a form of media theory in practice because Hugo is really trying to reinvent cinema for art in a way by, by basically going back to this classic 20th century novel called Our Little Volcano and then knowing that there was a movie made by John Huston which most people think is not a very good film trying to remake the film, but rather than remaking the film as a film, he's remaking it as, as an exhibition. But I think also it's, 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 it's more successful even as a film because, because of the way he spatializes the sort of like the narrative. It's very innovative and, and very new to me. And I think it's groundbreaking in that sense. And 
most of you guys don't know this detail because because you're close to Hugo, but I think because it's being recorded, it's important for this to be mentioned that that what what he basically does is he dissects the he dissects the narrative and he pulls it apart like literally into these different outputs: the film part, the narration, the soundtrack, and really kind of like spreads it out in a way that breaks away from the linearity of how cinema is in a very unique way. And I think that is, in itself, even if we don't approach the content of the film, of, what, of, the, of the artwork and what Hugo's trying to say, or the work itself adds to what you go on to say, is sort of a very like, a important achievement. So congratulations. <laughs> now, uh, this part of the film, actually, I have something to say about this part of the film, not that this is on. I love this part of the film because to me, focusing, this is the only part in the film where the word museum, which is where the piece is being shown, comes up. And to me, even though Hugo probably didn't even mean this, but to me this part of the film sort of is the state of contemporary art. He's like, morbid, deadly objects on some kind of a move, but really it's just like something that, the artwork is something Hugo stumbles upon in his film. It's not really like the focus of the piece. The piece is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a risk and it's not really sort of like done for the, for the way art world loves things. It's just something that Hugo wanted to do. And, and to me the film, the film and the, and the piece here is in contrast with that is our artwork. That's the contemporary artwork we have out there through this countless circulation of like star names and press releases and stuff that we all get 50 of them a day from different places. There's that and then there's this great piece that we're in which I get a, I get a chance to say a few, few more words about. Now when I was, uh, first thing when I saw Hugo after coming here and saw how this is done was like I asked him, I said, what is the most important, what is the most important thing in the film? And then Hugo had his own ideas of what, what, what the few most important thing was, but I basically told him that in my opinion, the most important thing in the film, there are two important things in the film. One is this ongoing conversation between the, the Ivan and the council, which then gets extracted yes, and transformed and you get in the other room. And then the second thing is the fire. And fire gets a room on its own. It's basically one second or a few moments out of this film that then becomes like the second room and given equal attention and equal space almost to the film. So that, that is a very important part of, the, part of the show. And it's central because it's in the middle. I don't know if you guys want to put, your, put, put this on and and go in, which I don't mind because it's quieter there. Few, few things about the few things about the fire that makes it the most important kind of motif from the film is first of all, as we all know, Hugo's burning his painting here and. Once the painting was moved up where he was shooting the film, the painting um, came apart as a result of uh, storms and wind. And then he basically decided, to, he wanted to actually, when I saw him first in like last year, or maybe earlier on this summer or spring, he told me he wants to burn the, burn the painting. But then me and a couple of people tried to convince him not to do that. And then he told me he's not gonna burn the painting. I don't, and I don't know how, uh, how sincere he was when he said that, but I believe him that he is not going to burn it and he is going to somehow incorporate it in the show. But then as we all know later, the painting was destroyed in the wind and then he decided to go ahead and burn it. So then that became sort of like the, this, this important image here. And this fire here, of course the easiest way to read that is like, it basically he was like, doing away with, with his past practice and burning it and starting anew with something, right? And, but there's, there's, there's other things that makes it kind of interesting because part of it for me is how the painting, uh, which used to be real and shown in an exhibition, kind of enters the film and becomes its own representation or becomes virtual, goes from real to virtual and then 
gets burned and then it becomes reactualized through this uh, abstraction that comes out of it, these fabrics. And then how they kind of like then take over the whole show from here onto like every surface almost over there. Like you have plinths that are covered with this, pillows that are covered with it, the surface we are on are covered with it. And away he goes from this social realist or just realist painting that has a lot of references to uh, like actual violence and history of violence in Western painting, which is in the background of the of the endless endless killing painting. He kind of literally burns that, and then and then you end up with this sort of like Jackson Pollock type abstraction. And as you know, people scholars of Pollock think that. Pollock was uh, also responding to the violence of World War II. So, so this meaningless abstraction that, that Greenberg and everybody was trying to sort of like understand as sort of having no relation to real world actually had a relationship to real world, which was Pollock was freaking out about that, the, the Holocaust of Jewish people, but also the possibility of nuclear Holocaust. And it kind of like, those, those uh, anxieties ended up creating those like, really crazy surfaces of, uh, of Pollock's work. And especially that painting over there, when the, um, when the light is on, it totally has this Pollock quality, like these like numbered Pollock paintings, like those large one in MoMA and other places. We, we've all seen representation of it, and some of us have seen the real ones. And, and it kind of makes sense to bring Pollock up because, because Pollock's work belonged to history of art slash media that moved to abstraction the way art came to the to New York and kind of like got transformed there after the World War II and also like I think I think here uh, like I was saying the way the way Hugo goes from his own sort of like realist paintings to abstraction to this act of violence has this like parallel with with Pollock but also I wanted to also read this little text from um, Toby uh, from the catalog that he wrote for the 2000 issue. He says, for him, painting is both rational and sensitive. He approaches his work at the level of a dia diaphr diaphragm between the brain and the stomach. Over the last couple of years, this has led him to establish a dialogue between abstraction and a style, which nods towards socialist realist painting. The artist approached topics of socio-political urgency by developing an interest in the history of mural paintings. That, of course, is talking about the endless killing. The fact that socialist ideals have established a tenacious frame of mind to the viewer continuously raises questions in his work. He is taking on a political legacy that is widely fading from the European city space or cityscape and revisits a dense history with a fresh approach. And then he basically calls it a snapshot of reality and, and says, at this very moment, the artist turns towards events to recent history and the work erupts like a volcano. <laughs> so uh, there it is. The, the burning to me is, I mean, I'm not trying to say that like, he was like making a full break from that, but in a way, it's sort of like this, this volcano that uh, Toby talks about. Now it's becoming more literal. It's actually the title of the work, and that's where the painting is being burnt. And I, but, I, but I do think you are kind of like moving, moving a little bit away from that, that, type, that type of work. But I could be wrong. Maybe you can address that when we get into a dialogue a little bit later on. But there are, there are other things about this, this, the violence at the core of the film that needs to be addressed. And... You know, in Endless Killing, what you have is this, the title suggested and the circularity of the painting is this ongoing violence that shapes the human history. But, but the type of violence we have here is final, is one, is a big one. The guy dies. The volcano, he falls into volcano and he dies. The painting gets destroyed. It's not circular anymore. It's a break. Something just big takes place. And because of the other stuff that I've been working on and thinking, this to me lines up perfectly with sort of like um, 
these anxieties we have about this, this, this century of ours. And I think Hugo was saying that the reviewer in a newspaper today said something about the Malcolm Lowry's original book, that it was m more about the future than about the past. Or like Ma Malcolm Lowry himself in the Guardian review, you said, right? Yeah. In the Guardian, in a Guardian interview, he talked about how the book is basically what was the word you used? It's a cryptogram. It's a cryptogram about the future. So Malcolm Lowry writing that book in the fifties, that is kind of about nineteen thirties between the two wars. For him, already had that quality of the future, and I think I think Hugo's piece itself has this this type of future anxieties in it, and it has to do with like the need to break from some type of past and. Jo we were joking about this earlier on and in a way you can you can also read I mean if you want to just apply it to to today's politics Yvonne the wife is Hillary Clinton and the drunk guy is America and then she comes back to save save the life for one last time and she can't do it and then he falls into the volcano and dies right but that's too like pop and too close right and I think and I think this is the problem also with the way people are reading into what's going on in America or the rise of the right wing and all the like conflicts that are going around in the world. It's very easy to understand them as something that is specific to this five, 10 years or like the post, post financial crisis, which actually took a big toll on your country uh, almost a decade ago. It's very easy to just think that this is just the short outcome of that. But there's also a way of looking at it in a longer trajectory, which kind of brings us back to like the, the the, the his, history of media that's embedded in a work uh, and that that has to do with like for regal actually which i actually brought the book and i thought maybe maybe later i get to read that passage for you for regal uh human history is divided between these three particular periods very straightforward you have antiquities you have middle ages and you have the modern age each one of these, of course, they don't end and begin like one after another. They're not like um, subway stops, but one bleeds into the other. One, as one ends, the other one's already starting. And it's very hard to say when one ends and when one starts because there's moments that the two, two periods are equally act activating the time, time of the human life, one on the way down and one on the way up. But then, but then for Regal, even writing about modern art in late 19th century, the book belongs to 1890s, and he died very young at the age of 47. He writes about the whole modern art as being like, and for him, modern art back then was Picasso and like, you know what I mean, what came out of like French painting, is already signs of a huge crisis for modernity. And for him, modernity is on its way to end. So he reads this 500 year from 1520, which is basically the, the beginning of reformation. To, to when he's writing the book in 19, 19, 1890s as like this period of mo modernity, early modern, modern, and late modern to him is ending. And abstraction and all that are sort of like the signs of this crisis, right? But I think maybe he was just too much too early in, in, in predicting that because for people who, uh, for some of my colleagues who are, have dedicated their life to these questions, particularly people who are interested in how history of technology lines up with the natural history or what we understand as Anthropocene and this impact of human on earth and then on the history of political economy and history of like basically history of politics. How these three interrelate and how we can use one to read the other or how they can be read together. These, these marks, 500 marks are very important again. They become important. So for, for for these people, we're now at the end of the modern era, or like 21st century is really the moment in which we are dealing with a brand new world. And so it's, it's, it's naive to try to think of what's happening in the world, the rise of the right wing, all these conflicts all around the world as something that belongs to just like a 10 year trajectory of economic crisis. This could actually be the beginning of major transformation that our culture, global culture will go through because the impact of computation on on life, the impact of these smart machines that are taking over is not unlike how print culture and Gutenberg basically contributed to the starting up of modernity. So that's what that's what people and if you want to know names, Benjamin Bratton, Matteo Pasquinelli, people like on, on, on the sort of the libertarian side, Nick Land, they all think that this is what the symptoms we're seeing, the symptoms of this major moving from this 
500 years of early modern, high modern, late modern into something else. And postmodernism itself was the end of modernity. It's, it's still part of modernity because it still uses the same language. And so to me, this fire and this burning and this, this anxiety that the work has is about this end of this longer trajectory in this longer period and this abstraction that comes out of it is a f part of it is fear of the unknown fear of something that cannot be imaged or understood as some image that makes sense to human eye both in terms of like a dark like dark thing that you can see but also the the mathematical abstractions that are at the core of this com complexified world that comes out of the interaction between nature politics and technology which Benjamin Bratton called the stacks. The, 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 mathem the abstract mathematical roots of that actually is what this abstraction to me is all about. It's about kind of like moving from this world of images that are totally understood and meaningful to humans to this world in which we no longer are able to understand what we see. So we're back at like, we're back at Jackson Pollock because because we basically we're, we're, we're facing a world in which we really cannot understand it really well or understand it in the ways we used to understand the world based on this what we understand as modernity and, and I mean come on the art we understand and the art we study really has to do with like renaissance to now right that's how we understand art that's how the idea of what an art artist is uh, what an artist, what is the role of an artist, how artists make art, it's all this, this, this period, it covers this, this from the romantic notion of what an artist is, to, from the early biographies of these uh, Michelangelo and Da Vinci written in 1500 in Italy, all the way to now, and we are at this turning point, and to me the piece is powerful because in a way, uh, the system building that, that Hugo has done here is a total system building, he's building a complex system of how to approach art and culture in a museum museum setting, preserving the complexity of 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 the piece without without compromising that, but still having part of it that is totally understood by human, which is the narrative and the characters, and part of it is totally like weird and kind of like alien, which is the abstract side, kind of like meet and melt melt in, in in the middle here and. And I'm saying this despite some of the stuff that I've heard from Hugo about the work because I actually don't think artists, artists know what they do. They understand their material very well. Good artists, they really understand their material. They also really, un really well understand the forms that they're doing and creating. They understand that. And they also have a pretty good idea of the type of audiences they like to provoke or bring into this, their trap. But I think the meaningfulness of the work is not bound by what artists think it is or the meaning that they thought the work would have. And the work once created have a lot of agency in terms of determining how it's going to be seen and interpreted. But I also don't think that it's totally indeterminate and anyone can read it in really a particular way because the, the, the way artists sets up the trap, the way the artist creates this environment for you to enter, limits what you can do with it. And I think leaving it indeterminate and open causes the garden of dead cars hanging around and going around and around. It creates that type of like indeterminate contemporary art that we see in, in contemporary art daily and we see it in like Basel and Frieze and all that. I mean, there's lots of good work there too, but they're exceptional in my opinion. So yeah, so this is this is sort of like a maybe a good point that you and me maybe can have some conversation, Mr. Artist. Mm -hmm. I I I like the way you go very bold to give uh, um, a straightforward. Uh, or a very accurate reading of uh, of the work, and um, because I I also believe that we don't um, we don't dominate the work. We don't we don't have we are more like mediums that make uh, things happen in front of us. It's our it's our. It's 
It's our wish to enlarge that possibilities that is sometimes a form of mediation of what is happening in front of us. And that, in that sense, um, returning to Pollock, I think uh, uh, his work is that of resistance against uh, an oppression of the rational over uh, society which is as present then as is today, or it's more today because we have other means of doing it. And I think that is a break that exists here in the, in, in the work, a division. But I usually divide to conquer the person to the other side as well. So, meaning that uh, the, the story would be maybe the trap for people to spend more time with it, to feel that they are understanding what's going on with... Uh, but then there's, there's so m much more communicating through touch, through uh, the corner of the eye, through your your ears and your stomach and so on and that is maybe uh, a bigger message that I don't control that, but that, that I'm proposing because it happened in front of me and I, I want to acquire it. Uh, well, but, but, you, but you agree that you've, you've created a very like, self-contained and perfectly closed system or closed perfect system. Uh, you've taken the, you've taken the book and you've turned it into a kind of like a form of artistic cybernetic system all these parts relate and deal with each other there's a logic to it that even my grandmother can understand because she will notice that the movie here does not have any sort of like background sound and it does not have any music and movies usually mix ambient sound and, and, and then and then she can go find them in the in the two ends of the room right and then, and then it was very obvious that like the dialogue are, are subtitled here and then there's a narrator voice coming from the other room. And then these are timed perfectly like, I mean, uh, yeah, they're, they're timed perfectly. I'm sure you spend hours and hours with your technician making sure these things line up perfectly and properly. So it's not like so like, I mean, I mean the work has some kind of like openness in it for the audience, but you actually have created a closed environment, a kind of like a like a laboratory out for this film, in which then the, the viewer can kind of like then think about things, about things that you want them to think about. Yeah, but that that is true, and it comes through the opacity of each language, in a way. I'm a, a total beginner concerning a film or cinema. It's, uh, I mean, it was quite good. But you made videos before. Yes. And I've been reading about cinema and I watched cinema, but I didn't study cinema. It's, uh, so I, I feel that I'm approaching from the outside in a way. So I have this, as much I experiment the medium in itself, I start to have a, a sort of analytical approach to it, where I can feel that this much is secure to, to build up a discourse through, in a very similar way to the use of the painting, that is abstract and it doesn't communicate, apparently it doesn't communicate, I think it communicates, but it's like, it's lying down, so you look in a perspective that is more like an animal and then is there vertical so you see it as human and then the, the, the thing about communication that we that we really have to understand and like i was i was uh the the last curatorial project i did in prague last year i mean this year earlier on times fly so fast uh i ran into this lacan text it's at the end of his seminar too and it's basically the first time where he talks directly about cybernetics and he talks about his reading of Freud as a form of cybernetics, which is very refreshing. And uh, in it, he basically talks about two types of communication. It's like what we were talking about in the hallway. One type of communication 
is the normative communication that the world is based on. It's the time of the world. It's, it's like the, the way universe talks to itself. It's the way nature talks to itself. It's the way your body parts all work together. It's the way the seasons look comfortably change to another, right? So that's one type of communication that allows the world to run its normal business. And then to him, there's this other one, which is the time of the ego or time of the human, if you want to call it, right? And there you're dealing with, so if, if, the, if, in, the, if in the regular communication, you have zeros and one kind of like uh, flowing really like uh, harmoniously, with the time of the ego, with the human, what you have is like, human is the foot, if the door closed is zero and door, door open is one, the human temporality is the one that either tries to like forces the door closed or put his foot between it. Kind of like interrupts it and that becomes a different type of communication. It's an interruptive communication. It still communicates but it's, it interrupts the, the flow of normal communication. And I think to me that is what good art does because that's why art is both communication and not communication. Or it's communication but it's a totally different type of communication. That you can't really, we have to have a different name for it. And, and that's why it's the highest form of technology because that type, that type of communication has a lot to do with taking over the space of the mind and making the mind go like whoa and kind of jolts it like almost it's like a it's like a shock therapy kind of information. If the regular information is looking at nature, art is a is a jolt to the brain. Good art. So I think I think there's a lot of that going on here in in, in the work, and that's why the work is powerful and and significant. Uh, it, it, al it also comes through uh, what I wanted to say is that it came a lot as a tangible knowledge you know uh, the fact that I had uh, so much time to develop the work it creates through experimentation risk chance novelty, ideas, preconceived ideas, projects, um, exchange with some of the people who are here as well, that it, it, it made a, a sort of a, a very positive uh, lab where I could get the right tools within a year to, to build up this system that closed down within the process of a year. So yes, it be, I became aware, but through through experience as well. That's what I wanted to. It, um, you know, like we both have read the Loser Cinema books, right? Yeah. And it's such a beautiful sort of like way of like it's it's as if you're doing like you're doing what the Loser did with films in text. You did it in the space. It's really like a new way of new way of filmmaking. And, but, but again, it's not because it's got multiple screen and multiple sounds and because a lot of installations have these. We were talking with Claudio about the work of this, this, this uh, German artist, which I saw twice, once in Vienna and once in Guangzhou Biennale. The name of the artist, look, escape me. Claudio, could you please tell us the name of the artist? Which, the one at the Ralph yeah, the downstairs at Guangzhou. Isn't it Renato Lawrence? Yeah, but Renato. Like more than one artist. Yeah, the two artists. Yeah. Yeah, it's a collaboration between Renato Lawrence and another another German artist, and they kind of like, it feels like, it's like this, but but it's not a it's not a it's not a perfectly closed system. It doesn't have that type of logic that say, you know, limits the work in order for the audience to then expand it. You know, then that's what that's what this piece does. It has these limits on it. You limit yourself because there's a logic to it. That's. That, and it's easy to get into it because that, the, er, the, the primary logic of the piece is easy to get into. It's based on a very well-known book. I mean, it's very well-known to me because Malcolm Lorry brought that book in Vancouver and I went to art school in Vancouver and I spent majority of my life in Vancouver and Malcolm Lorry is a very important figure in Canadian literature, even though he wasn't Canadian because he wrote this book in, in Vancouver. And we have like poetry clubs and like festivals named after under the volcano and Malcolm Laurie Hall and Malcolm Laurie Awards is a very important figure when you when you go to art school in Vancouver you immediately come across his name and and the kind of impact under the volcano had on literature and art in in the city of Vancouver so so you take this like very well-known piece of literature at least in the English-speaking world 
which you think it's Portuguese translation wasn't good or good enough and then you retranslate it in Portuguese but not necessarily in like like writing language but in a brand new language that you invent are very simple rules and that's what makes it powerful it's kind of like you know Rebecca Koitman right R.H. Koitman the yes. painter she does that too she creates these chapters of the book and she applies this very limited logic to paintings they're almost boring logic but actually that that limit lim, limits she puts on it is what gives the work its potential to be meaningful by the audience so I think that that to me is very important and, I, and you shouldn't discount it that's good it sounds very good to me. <laughs> yeah I, 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 I found uh, there's an analogy to a sort of uh, proto form of this that I, uh, I was trying through the use of uh, uh, monochrome which is this kind of language and how you by uh, placing in space in different positions and under different conditions you can uh, create that sort of communication that we are talking about. It's just, uh, I would bring uh, the, the, the novelty in relation to that past is that um, the game becomes more between one word and another, the way one word affects an image, the way the space in between the trap many times is like uh, uh, the f the failure in the narrative or the break in the narrative that makes you become active by immediately reacting to it. Oh, but the guy is saying that uh, they are walking slowly and with the hand, uh, or, and and they are not or something like that. So uh, there's an evolution. Yes, and I I. I'm very excited about the future in a way. Excited? Yes. Mm. Of my future. <laughs> oh. My future. My future. Oh, I'm excited right. about your future too because you're onto something very, very uh, powerful and new. Of but course. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not hopeful about the future of the world. Yeah, yeah. Because I, because you know these these large breaks that we talk talked about these these three or four. This, if if we if we agree that the fourth major historical period in human human civilization is about to begin they each are marked with like intense violence millions of people being displaced and dying just look at all the all the all the catholics and protestants who died as a result of reformation and then later on revolution and enlightenment we're heading towards stuff like that and i mean i'm not saying that to rationalize the type of violence that we might see coming out of this like the, the this newborn but in a way we have to be like anxious and ready for a lot of like really really dark days this is not going to be easy if 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 those who are diagnosing our our time with this type of transformation are right we're about to see really like this volcano is actually real it's not just a metaphor yeah. uh. but i'm glad for your future no, no, no. This, well, I mean, there's, there's a, the sort of happiness that comes from uh, almost like uh, the happiness that one has running because there's a moment that, for a brief moment, your two feet are not touching the the floor. It's kind of uh, like a horse a, galloping. Yeah. It's like uh, that. That is the happiness. That is a, a momentary thing. It's like a, a glimpse. Then I will fall back into this melancholic uh, state, or anxiety, or uh, uh, absurdity of life that c it has roots on all these existentialist writers and so on. That yes. Not so I have, I have a question. How did you come across the the Sartre text, and how did that kind of like became an extension of the Malcolm Laurie's uh, wife and husband conversation? And then you use the same actors who are in the film acting as Malcolm Laurie's characters 
then become starters characters? It was... Um, it came... It came as a, an opportunity to add uh, more layers and uh, more uh, more layers to the relation between that couple in the sense that uh, I was trying to run away from a, a sort of unified ver a vision of the world or, or a, so totally into heterogeneity or as a possibility to uh, uh, deal with the complex multiplicity of social political events and both historical and contemporary so I, I need to add uh, that complexity to to the to the to the characters to to release them from a sort of moral judgment that the guy is an asshole and she's uh, she's good or or whatsoever also because love was somehow important in the way I uh, I approached the, the the book but love for me is also um, a key moment to to unfold a series a series of uh, norms for me to work in the sense that uh, uh, Art should be erotic, and the way we think should be erotic. And I'm totally against this Apollinian pure form that will give the right meaning to life, or to this is the right good art, or whatsoever. So uh, they start to come together. Plus, uh, I was very interested in as. As a guy that previously have been sometimes, uh, I mean, I cannot escape from myself, from my kind of masculinity uh, or heterosexuality or whatsoever and so on. So I, I, I thought it would be very good uh, to, to bring a sort of emancipation of uh, a person. So that could be the other way around but give the value to the device that makes it visible to all as a tool to exchange the, the power roles as, as a kind of message that lies there in, 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 the, in the film in a way that, that was the interesting bit in, 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 in Malcolm Lurie's story she is the Yvonne is the more rational character yeah. and the husband Council is the irrational one, particularly in their encounter with that death that happens that foreshadows his death, right? Yeah. The Mexican guy that dies and yeah. they can't help him. Yeah. But in the Freud story, it's the in, in, in the in the in the Sartre story, it's the other way around. It's that it's the rationality of the doctor or the or the analyst that's on trial, and she's being the sort of like bit of a the irrational character. Is that is that a good way to to see it, or, or 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 maybe like maybe like the the woman in the in the postscript film is exercising a higher and a meta level of rationality, which says I'm gonna take over this technology and I'm gonna turn it against you, and I'm gonna put you on tape, just just for you to see how does it feel. Um. In the first one, Yvonne fails, but in the second one, there's something gets accomplished. It's um, yes, it it is. But there's there's also a third uh, a third possibility that is given by this weird therapy that would be a kind of harmony between the two of them somehow. Although they don't understand each other, they are talking about two different things. I I think the most important thing is to. Uh, uh, I think we spoke about this, the spiral movement is a spiral depending the, the perspective we have, you know, so that uh, we can look at her in one way and then in another. Uh, 
free us from taking a position that would be uh, I think mostly moral I, I've been very moralist I, I wanted to be a moral you wanted to be amoral amoral I've been very I think I, I've been I was shaped uh, by an education that was uh, communist and uh, a mixture between communism and Catholicism that gave me a, a high level of morality and I'm trying to get rid of it. It's, it's also a tryout, you know, it's like, I mean, the whole thing in that sense, it's a construction is defined but there's a lot of uh, a, a sort of a jump into a void on into an unknown apparently and then when you are dealing with the work you understand that you have lots of uh, uh, moments that you 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 understand where you are and what you want to do and then you start to build it up and you, you build it someone told me the other day uh, a very funny it's not funny story at all I had a car crash the other day and a friend a friend of mine told me that once he was walking at the lift of uh, next to the lift of a Jew a Jew uh, this one what's it called Uvador de Graça no Uvador de Santa Justa yeah it's this big Eiffel uh, tower and the guy just fall on the floor in front of him he commits suicide but it, the guy tried to grab a cable before he fall although he tried to commit suicide because your brain still is working to say I want to survive or maybe he changed his mind in that split second it's like <laughs> sorry I don't want to die but too late so that, that, but this, this uh, sort of answer, uh, a kind of answer to this uh, mixture between agony and happiness in a way. Uh, not like uh, uh, Albert Camus, uh, the plague where they give up and they start to make certain activities waiting for the plague to come and take their life. But still trying to live... Uh, your life in a way and make your not being like in certain moments of our history that people switch off and just say okay let's go let's go with them all in a way i want to i want to go back to some, the conversation we had you were telling me that you might uh recombine these elements to make an actual like maybe theater release or something you can watch in a like a like a like a viewing room rather than walking around in a gallery and watch it uh, it, it will be interesting to see how you would do that if you ever decide to do that and still preserve some sense of it sort of like a complex structure with because it's very easy to say okay I have all the environmental sound I have music I have dialogue I have narration I have a lot of footage and this fire can be reintegrated back into that and boom you end up with like a perfect film that people can watch in a theater yeah you know like a, in, a, in a film festival for instance right and you know this is um, the, the significance of what you've done here is you know um, um, is and this part of it is like truly truly like relates to like the, the science of the mind and and this writer Metzinger who talks about how a uh, philosopher or like neuroscience philosophy he is a philosopher of neuroscience philosopher of new science he writes about how reality is all separated entities and this complex world but our brain has a processing power that kind of like blends it all together and makes it linear and feeds it to you as if you're really encountering one thing, which is the world, and then it becomes real, and then world becomes this real thing, and then all this process actually has to be camouflaged by the mind, otherwise you freak out. If you constantly are aware of how your mind is making the world into a seamless one-track movie, 
you basically freak out and you won't even leave the bed. But your mind in, in its evolution has kind of like made this process uh, opaque. So then you can actually deal with the reality. Otherwise, the complexity will just drive most people nuts. So, and, and you know what, I see these like two poles to the, to the film. The one track film, if you ever do it, it's kind of like that Met, Metzinger idea of a average person's approach to the world. And then the piece here is this complex scientific way in which reality unfolds to the mind, which then gets combined into what we consider like reality. And this is also a little bit has to do with like this other philosopher's work, uh, Bernard Stiegler, who thinks are basically along the same line, except he doesn't like talk about the comp complexity side of it so much. He thinks like our awake time is a way of uh, basically we have this cinematic consciousness that, that appears to us like cinema and that's why arriving at cinema for humanity is such an important thing because we finally were able to create a, an art form that is the closest way to the way we experience the world which is time based and has sound and images combined so so yeah so how would you do that if you ever if, if you were going to recombine this and actually make it into like a like a singular cinematic experience rather than this complex cinematic experience how would you do that is there a way to preserve some of this because it's very nice to preserve preserve parts of this uh, the the wish was the wish is the wish is to try a second life for for the for the same the same object and i'm I'm, I'm trusting the experience of making and mostly the work on edition to, to believe that it will bring a novelty with it that will be, if possible, at least a good version of it in, instead of being just a, a, an adaptation to the, to the screen. So I... But it, it came from um, it came from the moments of edition where I sometimes felt that I sacrificed things for the sake of that construction I, I had. So it's a mixture of joy and a mixture of will to to test a new life, to make a new out of the same material, which is very similar to the way a, f a few of these practices or precise works were reinvented and reused. It seems that if I use a work or a technology like sp splashing paint over fabric for a precise ending, I, I enlarge the possibilities of my previous uh, uh, usage. So I'm trying to keep this motion in a way. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read this is just one page, right? And again I'm just gonna say what I'm, I'm reading from Regal's Historical Grammar of Visual Arts. Uh, the book was originally basically is a one book in two different versions. Mm -hmm. It's like ten sessions of teaching of art history he did in the Vienna Academy with the time difference of 10 years so it's like the course he taught in the early early earlier his early career as an art historian and then how he taught the course in the last years of his life so basically the book repeats but this page I'm reading only appears in the first uh, first first version it doesn't the second version kind of begins with a with a with with a book and does not have this one page and here he basically provides us with an understanding of the, the German term Weltanschauung or worldview and, and relates it to like art. So he says, within noble historical time, the understanding of man's relation to matter, which we simply call human worldview, has undergone two substantial changes. The history of visual art can consequently be divided into three major periods, which correspond in essence to ages already long applied in the fields of human, 
political and cultural history. And we can add technological history there too. Antiquity, the Middle Ages, and the modern era. The first period encompasses all antiquity to the year 313 with the proclam proclamation of Christianity as the official state religion in the Roman Empire. The second consists of the Middle Ages and Renaissance, strictly defined up to 1520, with the death of Raphael and Pope Leo X, and the expansion of the Reformation. Everything after that we ascribe to the third and the modern period. It need hardly be stated explicitly that the two above specified dates, the two that divides the three, right? may not and shall not be held as absolute boundaries. Rather, within each age, we may distinguish three sub-periods. The first, representing the development of a particular worldview. The second, usually the briefest, representing the worldview at the peak of the perfection. And the third, representing the process of its decline and eventual collapse. As a rule, the final sub-period provides as much insight into the subsequent worldview as that which it brings to a close. Conversely, this is the, this is the part that kind of like becomes art. Conversely, no obsolete worldview once overcome vanishes instantly from the face of the earth, although it might not preserve, persevere as a deep-rooted conviction, it can, thanks to the pressure of tradition, continue to reverberate for centuries in outer forms. These forms play the most important role in the visual arts. So basically for him, visual arts is the tracing of these past worldviews on the surface of the new one. So, because it's kind of like culture is skeuomorphic. So, uh, even though this work we're uh, dwelling inside it, the work we're dwelling inside right now seems to be uh, using surfaces from the, from the previous worldview, like Pollock, cinema, all this stuff, but it tells us much more about the future of art than it tells us about the, the period that, that I basically think is ending. So this is sort of like how how this work can be can be approached in terms of uh, what what it holds in it for the future as as like the art of this unknown period that's starting. Because if we if we if we agree that we're at the end of a long period of five six hundred year period of modernity, each period has its own art. And this basically the book, if you ever get a chance to read it, is one of the most fascinating books on art, on history of art. Uh, the book is about how these three different periods of art influence each other and what gets carried over from antiquity into Middle Ages, into modernity. And we can just assume that we can also argue that a lot of, a lot of modernity is being carried over into the future one. And this work could be an example of it that we're, we're just looking at now.